welcome to you all. Um, this is a uh, this is part of the Festival of Ideas. This this um, event, uh, the Festival of Ideas, has been running at SOAS for since the 29th of October. This is number ten out of twelve events we're doing. The theme of the festival is thinking through music. And we've done a wide range of things. We've had jazz jam sessions. We've had interviews with various people. Hi, David. Nice to see you. But could you turn your camera off just for the moment? Thank you. Um, we've had um, we've had panels on a DJ summit. Five DJs talking about what it's like to DJ. We've had panels on dance. We've had panels on the relationship between film and music. Uh, we've got a, a concert with Balake Sissoko, the great uh, Mali and Cora player, coming up next week. But today. We're having a very special uh, discussion. Uh, I should have said, my name is Casper Melville. I'm the director of the Festival of Ideas, and I'm sitting here at SOAS, the University of London, in the, cent in the center of London. I know many of you will be spread all over the place. And I think it's worth saying that, you know, we've really enjoyed in the festival and this year getting back to face-to-face -to -face events. It's been wonderful not to have to mask up and, or, or do everything virtually. But I think we should recognize what media theorists like myself call the affordances of, of technology. And we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now if it weren't for those glorious folks at Zoom, um, because we're spread around the place. Um, I think um, one of my guests is, is in London, not far from here. Another one of my guests is sitting on the in the corridor just over there. Uh, I think one of the others is in Berlin and one of them is in the United States. So we wouldn't be able to do this if it weren't for digital. I really appreciate you joining us for this discussion. So what we're gonna do is this. We're discussing, well, we've given it the title Decolonizing Music Education. I think it might, at some point, we might pick up that, that word decolonizing and have a think about whether that's a useful word, whether it's a, a term that we feel comfortable with. But generally speaking, we're talking about the relationship between um, race and music theory and music education. And we're coming at it from a number of different angles. So I've assembled a quite wonderful group of guests for you uh, to, to listen to and also to talk to. Um, and I'll introduce you to them now. We'll get to know them more when we, when we uh, you know, talk in some detail. So first of all, Phil Ewell down here, I don't know where he is on your screen. He's my bottom right here. Uh, it's from Hunter College. He's a musicologist, he's a, he's a musician. Um, and in many ways, his writing has been the inspiration for this um, for this panel, and we'll talk in detail about the piece of writing, particularly uh, one one particular essay, which has had a big impact in musicology circles, but also wider than than just formal musicology across everyone who teaches about music and cares about race and music and questions of white supremacy and justice and diversity. So, uh, welcome, Phil. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, okay. Moving around, we've got Catherine Schofield. Hi, Catherine. Uh, Catherine is, is a senior lecturer, I'm going to say, at King's in the music department, uh, formerly at SOAS, one of ours. Um, I think your expertise, Catherine, is in India, the Indian region. Yeah. Uh, you're always posting wonderful pictures, and it looks like Indian music from the past. But yeah, Mughal Mug Mug India and, and colonial India. Mughal Indian colonial India, wonderful, very welcome. So you're the ethnomusicologist representing ethnomusicology here. Um, and then we have Kaya Malami, uh, also a SOAS alum. Um, and I, in the blurb for this event, I called him a music technologist, technologist but that's not really a fair um, summary of what he is. He's a musician, he's a producer, uh, you know, he's been across lots of different genres, electronica and punk. Uh, he's, a, he's a highly regarded oud player. And, uh, but he has, been meddling with music technology and some of the things he's been doing, uh, I think are very concrete and fascinating examples of exactly the kind of white racial frame that Phil has identified as, as, as being embedded within music education. And last, but by no means least, uh, Nate Holder, who is uh, sitting, well, on my left as I look at it, but also just over the corridor from me. He's come to SOAS because he's got a gig just down the road in the Pizza Express. Uh, straight after this talk, or perhaps even before the talk finishes, depending on how far we go, how long we go. Don't worry, I'll be going down to the show afterwards, representing everyone who's here. So thank you, guests. And if we were in a room, I'd get everyone to give you a big round of applause, but, you know, virtual applause or that kind of clicky things. Um, so let's, let's, let's start, Phil, if we may, with, with you, since it was you who kicked this whole thing off, in my mind at least. Um, you wrote an essay, I think it's 2012, 
Um, and 2020. Uh, sorry, 2012. No, stupid. Sorry, 2020, two years ago now. And in this essay, you identify what you call a white racial frame, which structures the way in which music theory is taught. I want uh, if you could just, I know this is a bit, you know, obviously people can go out and read the article and it's, you know, it's, it's full of amazing things, but perhaps you could just summarize, maybe start with why you felt that you wanted to write this and maybe give us a sense of your background, which has led, led you to the point where you felt you had to write it. Absolutely. Thank you, Casper. And thanks, everyone, for having me. It's great to be part of this estimable panel uh, with Nate and Catherine and Kaim. Um, so I think I'll start by saying um, the four words that I began a plenary talk in November of 2019, because that will essentially let you know what right, white racial framing is in a very in a very real sense. I began a talk uh, that I gave in November 2019 with four simple words. I said, Music theory is white. And in so doing, I violated the white racial frame that we have in the United States. I'm supposed to use, and we have all been taught by whiteness, usually white men themselves, um, to use coded language to not identify whiteness. That's one of the, the, the big tenets of whiteness in any white supremacist system. If I had used such coded language, I would have started with four different words, slightly different. I would have said music theory lacks diversity, which was the agreed upon way at the time two years ago to say music theory is white, but you don't say white. Of course, if music theory were 95% African-Americans, it would also lack diversity, <laughs> right? But it's not, it's of course, it's 94% among tenured faculty, that's just a fact. And they're the people with power. Um, so people could tell right away that this was going to be a different talk. Um, and after that, I did publish this long article that Casper referenced, and that came out in June of 2020, and that's called Music, Music Theory and the White Racial Frame. Um, but just a little bit of background, um, if I could then. Um, yes, I'm a cellist, and uh, you can see a cello right over there. That's I have three cellos in my room here. And um, I am black. My dad was African American, but but I'm actually mixed race. My mother was from Norway, and there is my little Norwegian flag right there. <laughs> <laughs> and she never became a U.S. citizen. She was a proud green card holder of these United States of America until she passed in 2010. And by some miracle, my parents did stay together since they were married in 1960, seven years before Loving v. Virginia. Uh, essentially got rid of um, uh, the anti-miscegenation anti laws that uh, forbade uh, Blacks and whites from marrying in the United States. That was 1967. Um, at any rate, the reason why I got into music in just a few sentences, uh, my dad, African-American dad, was very committed, in fact, to white racial framing. And that's one of the most important parts I think, to take away from a white racial frame. That, that language is, by the way, from Joe Fagan, a very famous sociologist at Texas A&M University, a great American and an elderly white uh, man, by the way. Um, and uh, my dad, who was black, was very committed to white racial framing. He believed that the greatest author was Shakespeare, that the greatest composer was Beethoven. And he would have uh, vehemently denied that these things had anything to do with race which is another thing that whiteness teaches us. You're not supposed to link the greatness of our Michelangelo's or our Shakespeare's to race. You just can't do that. It's above race, right? It's, it's the non-racial greatness and exceptionalism and all of that stuff that we have been taught is so operative with, with people with names like uh, Shakespeare and Beethoven and Brahms. So um, taking that, uh, that, that, um, that uh, impetus from my dad. I began playing the cello and I ended up going into cello and classical music. I spent years in Russia training. I, I'm a Russian speaker also. In fact, that's where I met my wife, um, uh, who is a dual citizen with Russia and the United States, as is our 13 year old son. We don't need to go down the Russia rabbit hole right now. That's probably too painful for me anyway. But yeah. nevertheless, I, um, I, I, I did spend seven years of my life in total in Russia, and that was all part of the white racial framing. Of course, um, you know, Tchaikovsky and Shostakovich and Prokofiev are very much part of our music academies, uh, certainly in the United Kingdom and, and as well in the United States. Um, but I did uh, go through some troubles uh, in my career, uh, most 
most significantly, a 10-year battle for two years. I had to fight to get tenure at my university. This was 2014 to 2016. And uh, consequently, I did emerge victorious after two years, but there was a lot of anti-Blackness going on at that time with the person who was in power uh, for our department. He's since retired. Um, and because of that, that's why I went down this path of race scholarship in a more significant way. I'm not naive. I always have known that racism is a thing worldwide, but that's really what pushed me in that direction. I should also mention that um, I'll do one shameless plug for a book that I have coming out this spring uh, at the University of Michigan Press, which is a summation of all of these ideas, uh, an extension, if you will, of this of that long article that uh, that I wrote. It's called On Music Theory and Making Music More Welcoming for Everyone. It should be available in March or April of next year at the University of Michigan Press. No more shameless plugs. Um, so at any rate, I began doing this work to dig into the into the dirt of music theory and figure out why, in fact, as the American Society for Music Theory tells us, 94% of tenured faculty, that which is to say faculty with power at our music institutions and conservatories, are white. That's their number, not mine. Um, and furthermore, these 94% uh, white people in the society desperately talk about diversity and inclusivity and how they want to make these changes. Well, for 20 years, I watched that and uh, I realized that nothing changes. In other words, 20 years ago, it might've been 96% white people <laughs> with tenure. And over 20 years, it became 94. So I think it's pretty clear that that, that which was said in these white frameworks that they really do want to bring in people of color and more women and, and, and other minoritized groups um, was just actually not true. So that, that's really what, what the goal of this, of this work is, is trying to figure out why that's the case. Um, a couple of more points uh, about the, the, the project and, um, and, and what I was trying to do. I very much wanted to focus on the United States and music theory. I was born in Long Beach. I'm a US citizen only. And I'm a music theorist. I have a PhD from Yale University, one of our, our finest music theory programs for PhDs, and I, I limited it to that. It's really important. It's really uh, amazing to me how quickly it went beyond the United States and its borders and beyond the field of music theory. Um, I think maybe the country first and foremost that has commented on my work outside of the United States would be, well, probably Canada first and then the United Kingdom, maybe the United Kingdom first and foremost outside of the United States. And I often have to say, I'm not writing about England. You can comment all you want, English people, that's fine. But I don't know. And I've had people comment quite uh, agitated, you know, sometimes consternated. And uh, it's quite easy for me to say, I'm really only call it, you know, talking about the United States. But of course, these arguments uh, extend beyond the United States and they extend beyond music theory. Um, now, uh, with respect to music theory, it's really important to point out, uh, and I think uh, Catherine will talk about uh, ethnomusicology in, and, and, and it's, um, uh, I don't want to use the word complicity in white racial framing, that might be a little bit too strong, but it's uh, involvement in uh, white racial framing in our music academies. But it's really important to note that in the United States, music theory broke off from musicology. Of course, all of this comes from uh, Musikwissenschaft, right? The German um, concept of musicology and then the Vergleichende, which is the comparative musicology, which became ethnomusicology, right? The systematisch and the historisch uh, branches, which became loosely speaking music theory in the United States, that would be the systematic musicology as opposed to historical musicology. And I make that point because so many people outside of music theory have, have commented on this work. And again, I have to say, I'm a music theorist. So you can say what you want about ethno, about ethnomusicology, musicology, mm -hmm. but I'm looking at this as, as a music theorist. So those Bill, are the- Sorry to interrupt you, but just one yeah. issue, which is always interesting for those of us who are well outside the classical music world, which I am, which is that music theory lays claim to music as if it's the theory of all music, but in fact, Absolutely. it's a rather specific form of music, which lies Absolutely. at the heart of music theory. Yeah, and what that's- that music? Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. So music theory in its United States sense is a very rarefied field, which acts exactly what Casper said. It does lay claims to make these broad assertions about music 
and how music works in the grandest scheme of things. And the final point I'll talk about here, because this was a big part of the, the paper, was the figure Heinrich Schenker, um, who loomed large in that paper. Now, this was a, I, I called in the, in the long article, a fervent racist. And there's no question that he was if you simply read what he wrote. He was very prolific in terms of just writing prose. And he was extremely hateful and angry and anti-Semitic. He was Jewish himself, yet he was quite anti-Semitic. There's some very anti-Semitic uh, writings that he wrote. He was an inveterate racist, yes, and he was uh, anti-woman. He had many uh, sexist comments. And um, I simply pointed out, but I highlighted the anti-Black and the racist comments in that talk and then in that paper uh, very strongly. Uh, Heinrich Schenker died in 1935, and he died in Vienna, so I guess he died on time in that sense. Um, so people have used, his his ideas came to the United States in the late 1930s. The first person who, who would uh, promote them was called Hans Weisse, and then other figures like Alvaz Jonas, Jonas uh, Ernst Oster, and others. And they uh, have promoted his ideas, something as, as almost biblical in music theory. And uh, it always struck me as strange that it, it did strike of a cult almost, the way that we were supposed to follow this figure. I always did very well in my Shankarian analysis classes. I've taught it myself at the graduate level. But it always seemed a little unseemly to me to just completely erase all of the, the racism and the hate and the anger. It's especially because Schenker very clearly said himself, please don't erase the racism when you teach my musical ideas. They're yeah. part of the same system. Well, that's, so, such I, a, Phil, that's such an important part of what you say there, because it's not just that you're saying, here's a person who had this kind of dark secret that he was a racist. It's that you draw parallels between the racial thinking and the thinking about music around this question of kind of hierarchy. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, um, so it, 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 exactly. The, 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 he, he was very clear when he was saying that he wanted to put these two things together. He had a very unified worldview. And certain uh, figures, conservative figures, have questioned my uh, linking of his hierarchical racial thinking with his hierarchical musical thinking. And Many people have misquoted many things that I've said. That's very common when somebody dis disagrees on a kind of gut level, but they can't really say, they can't say that Schenker didn't praise Adolf Hitler. He did. Here's what he said. And, and it's almost as if I get treated as if I <laughs> praised Adolf Hitler. Yes, I have been called a black anti-Semite. That's just part. That's just part of of doing this work, right? It's it's just it's part of the silly response. But to get back to the hierarchical question, Casper, and I'll finish up. Um, it's extremely uh, important to realize. I've never said that hierarchies don't exist. They're in nature. They happen all over the place. And if somebody would like to point them out and make uh, an argument, fine. What we cannot do with Heinrich Schenker and what we have done in mu American music theory is we have separated his belief that racial hierarchies and musical hierarchies were part of the same system. And it's not by chance that his 12, yes, only 12, that was the number he had. There were only 12 true genius composers to Heinrich Schenker. In his mind, of course, they were all white cisgender men. We, we don't really even need to say that. I often do like to point out, however, that one of them was, wait for it, Domenico Scarlatti. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just great right because yeah. you no know, no it's not Tchaikovsky it's not even Wagner it's not in other words people that that our white racial frame tell us are in fact the genius great composers but even Schenker himself um you know didn't have them on the list but he had Domenico Scarlatti which already kind of points to this ridiculousness but but the 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 the, the disambiguating the, the 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 separation of 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 Schenker's uh horrific beliefs about people versus his somewhat useful ideas about music, admittedly, has in fact caused a situation whereby in the United States, we have created very hostile environments in our music classrooms for people who do not identify as white cisgender men, preferably straight, right? So there's something about the system that has been created, which continues to exclude, despite all the rhetoric about diversity and inclusion and all of that stuff, it continues to reproduce the whiteness 
at the heart of the system. And um, that's that is exactly what right, white racial framing is, right? That's what Joe Fagan has written a, several books on. So thank you. I, I'll stop now to let, to let my Thank colleague. you very much. And we're going to get back, I hope, to the responses to the paper, because I think it's been quite uh, fascinating and what to see what it's flushed out. The point I'd love to make, just Phil, just this reminds me very much of when I was a, 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 a postgraduate student, I did a course with Paul Gilroy, a, a goldsmith, when he was teaching in the sociology department. And uh, he made us read Heidegger. And he didn't want us to stop at the point, which was a fact, which was that Heidegger was a Nazi. He wanted us to read the philosophy and figure out if there was some connection between the nature of the philosophical thought and the, and the you know, racism, the overt racism. And, and I feel that what you're doing is very sort of similar. That's what it reminded me of. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I should just say, uh, just uh, for those of you uh, watching that, Poor old Nate, we, I stuck him in the classroom, which has got these lights, which just seem to go off whenever. So, he, you know, he is there, he will talk, and when he talks, he's going to put his light on. Uh, but for the moment, Nate, you don't have to keep getting up and doing it. I'm really sorry about that. It's not his fault. It's so as. Catherine, we've already heard about ethnomusicology, a little bit about the origin of ethnomusicology as when it broke away from music theory. So to be very crude, music theory, classical music, right, staying with, you know, the Western art music tradition, Ethnomusic or musicology developing into ethnomusicology. It's comparative. Clearly, ethnomusicology knows that not all composers are white, right? Because you're looking at music from India and Africa and Middle East. So there's no problem with ethnomusicology, right? It doesn't suffer from these same things, surely. <laughs> well, hi everybody. It's quite lovely that that I'm the nice white lady on the panel because uh, ethnomusicology is the nice white lady of music studies. <laughs> so it's it is of course complicit in in whiteness and complicit in patriarchy and all sorts of sorts of ways. Um, but before I get onto ethnomusicology, I just wanted to respond a little bit to to Phil's um, Phil's essay and 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 to his his work on Schenker because of course I I went to conservatoire. I was a viola player uh, in Australia and um, and. And we did Schenker. We had an American music theorist, and I love Schenker because Schenker just, you know, works. It's 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 really easy if you've got a kind of a mathematical brain and so on. Um, and um, but it only works for a very specific repertoire, and it's basically those twelve composers plus other people writing in that very specific kind of seventeen eighty to nineteen hundred style uh Europeans right so so this is a really important point and I um I left um uh Western classical music behind um uh largely because I was bored um with being a viola player <laughs> in a chamber orchestra same thing over um, and over again is it <laughs> <laughs> where basically you get to Beethoven, you, you don't do the 1780 to, to, to 1900 stuff. <laughs> um, but, um, but, uh, but I fell in love with Hindustani music. And I remember my professor, Richard Widdis, who was at SOAS, I asked him once, you know, why, you know, as somebody who was really keen music theorist and continued to be a music theorist, continues to be a music theorist um, all his career, um, as well as being an ethnographer. I, sa I said, what, what, what got you interested in, in Indian music? And he said, well, I found the raga really compelling and I just did not see why uh, it should not be subject to the same kind of equality of treatment in terms of music theory and understanding it from a from the the point of view of its patterns and its and its uh, compulsions and its phrases and its tensions and so on, as Western art music, and you know that it should be on an equal platform, which you know which I loved. Um, but the other point I wanted to connection I wanted to make about with Schenker is that the first time. I, I, you know, I hadn't done Schenker since the early 90s. And the first time I read Phil's piece, I was just like, oh, my God, he was a horrific racist, horrific racist. Um, and I hadn't known that. Um, and it reminds me, I spent a lot of time online as a historian of colonialism and, and of empire, um, you know, arguing with people who say, oh, empire wasn't that bad. There were good things about it, but Trains the, rail are, but the railways, you know, yeah. hashtag, but the railways. Um, and 
you know, my argument is that anybody who thinks that empire wasn't racist and was largely benign, et cetera, simply has not spent enough time reading the primary sources. And this is really true of the primary sources for the beginnings of comparative musicology, um, which are, you know, are essentially biological racism, but placed in this very kind of systematic, systematic, you know, um, supposedly empirical frame, which the, you know, the, the white racial frame, but in this case, the, the colonial frame. Um, and um, so um, musicology, you know, historical musicology, the history of the people with history, i.e. us, um, and comparative musicology for Kleikinta Music Wissenschaft were actually invented at the same time um, and split at the same time in 1888 by uh, a German, um, or possibly Austrian, but Ger Germanic uh, music um, philosopher called Guido Adler. Um, and um, this split has been maintained ever since. Um, and comparative musicology eventually evolved into a slightly different discipline, ethnomusicology, after um, the horrendous result of World War II, you know, which was the, you know, the ultimate in eugenics, um, which had been the driving force behind a lot of comparative musicology. You compare the rest of the world's music today to find the historical roots from the most primitive, primitive musics to the most sophisticated music, which of course is Western art music. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and because the history of Western music is embedded in today's musical systems. Uh, anyway, it, 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 it became really apparent through long study of this material that this just simply wasn't true. Um, and that, um, so to say that, uh, Hindustani music, the music I study in North Indian classical music, um, was the same as the music of ancient Greece in evolutionary terms, um, was just simply not true and bizarre. And really, they had no relationship and etc. Um, and the um, this led to an understanding that um, the music of the world needed to be treated as um, essentially equal and equally interesting and um, very much um, informed by anthropology um, and looking at music as part of a whole uh, cultural system. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. If I could, so, if I could Catherine, that, that's yeah. a great point, this whole equality and, and putting things on an equal playing field. It's extremely yeah. unnerving for in, in the white racial frame to do that for the simple reason that it, it upsets the racial order of things, right? Yeah. The, the historical racial order of things. To also, it, it, in terms of white supremacy, it also upsets the, the patriarchal order of things in a very similar fashion. It's something yeah. that, that I And it's some, something that's always struck me is, is that um, the Society for Ethnomusicology in the United States, for example, is about 50-50 women and men, which, mm -hmm. which historically uh, the American Musicological Society and the Society for Music Theory were not. And I think this is, this is, this doesn't, doesn't necessarily say anything, <laughs> but it's yeah. an interesting thing to, to, mm -hmm. to think about. And so ethnomusicologists have always kind of seen themselves as, the good guys, right? <laughs> we're the good guys. We're the ones who recognize the equality of the rest of the worlds, except when you notice that most of them are white and, it, you know, the, the the level of kind of smuggery is, is kind of slightly breathtaking. Um, and there's always been this kind of real kind of tension about who ethnomusicologists actually are, because there's always this sense that they've kind of broken away from musicology by, you know, downplaying history, downplaying music theory, focusing on anthropology, but then what do you do with, you know, historical work on non-Western cultures? So there's this weird kind of split. And the basic problem, as I see it, is that if we are going to decolonize uh, music studies, we would actually have to destroy the split between musicology and ethnomusicology. And, you know, and and if, if one thinks of music theory as currently being part of um, musicology and ethnomusicology as being on the other side of the split, as it always has been, that split needs to kind of be erased. And we need to be thinking about history 
of all of the world's music, anthropology of all of the world's music, theory of all the, all of the world's music. But the problem is there is so much invested institutionally in maintaining the split, especially in somewhere like the United States where people get hired to music theory positions. And when they're hired to music theory positions, they're not hired if they are, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, but they're not hired if they're um, theorists of Indian ragas. That's right. <laughs> they don't know about music, proper music. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that music theory is specifically why in that case. But just before um, Phil's um, article got some attention from the Shankirians, which I'm, I know somebody else will talk about, um, uh, there was a big um, uh stone thrown in the pond, the, 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 the complacent pond of ethnomusicology. Um, it's really, really important article by Danielle Brown, which is an open letter on racism in, in music studies, yeah. um, especially in ethnomusicology and music education. And her point was that um, there is this very kind of complacent sense that um, that ethnomusicology is fine, not racist, etc., except it perpetuates um, racism by basically putting all the white people, you know, it's, it's, it's white experts. And, and, and being confronted with one's whiteness is actually really, um, can be really quite threatening and painful and very hard to kind of sit and listen. And this created a huge um, uh, storm um, in ethnomusicology online and on the Society for Ethnomusicology list, which eventually led to the resignation of the of SEM's president. Um, and um, but what she had to say was absolutely true. And I just just to kind of um, you know sort of finish off, I just want to read a little bit from Gage Averill's uh, letter. Um, you know, in support of her um, saying. Um, let me just find it. Um, people should think about why leadership in SEM is not attractive to scholars of colour, because there's very few scholars of colour uh, who, who so far have risen, risen to the top of the Society for Ethnomusicology. It's very wide. Mm -hmm. It may have something to do with tokenism, but also with the lack of a pervasive change in attitude in a, our society, a society that's supposed to be about a non-hierarchical dialogue of world cultures, but that still tends towards the representation, representation of the rest of the world by a privileged white Western intelligentsia and Professor Averill says, of which I am very much a member. Um, SEM's recent statement of support for Black Lives Matter enters a very crowded space of virtue signaling that unless it is accompanied with a re deep change in how this society thinks of itself, will be heard as just more good intentions, which can be toxic without real change. And that was really the kind of, you know, sort of upshot of, of of that discussion and just to kind of put it very briefly in context the uh, edims report was published last week um which is the equality diversity and inclusion in music studies report on basically the state of what music education looks like in 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 the uk uk higher education and um and they found that only um, one sixth of British Asian people, of, uh, students of British Asian backgrounds in com compared to the rest of the university cohort are in music studies. It's only 2%. And that remains the case all the way through to kind of professor level. Um, half the numbers of black British students um, who you'd expect com with, you know, compared to the demographic um, start as undergraduates and it diminishes and diminishes and diminishes. So rather than set the, the British Asians just basically staying the same at 2%, um, it diminishes amongst people who are black and mixed race to the point that there are no black professors in music studies, in higher education in the United Kingdom. And that is the real issue to me. Catherine, thank you. I mean, if, if, if we can come out of this meeting by destroying two disciplines <laughs> uh, in one go, let's do it. I, I really appreciate that. Um, um, a couple of things I want to just say that please feel free to use the chat while we're talking. We won't um, you know, put questions or comments or anything like that. After we've kind of reached a natural end to the, the discussion that we're having, we will open the floor 
and um, we'll encourage you to, to ask those questions and turn on your camera. You don't have to, we can read them out from the chat, but feel free to um, use that. Use that. Um, in fact, I was going to go to Kayam next, but I think because of what you just said, Catherine, I think I want to, I want to hear from Nate uh, right now. Nate, he's just going to go and turn on his, um, oh, look, I can see myself in his camera. That's weird, isn't it? Hello. Um, he's just turning on his light. The reason I wanted to go to Nate is because you made this, this, this statement about, you know, the lack, basically the lack of, uh, the, the lack of black teachers teaching music, the, the lack of interest or apparent lack of interest of black students. And, and Nate is kind of on the cold face of that a little bit. Nate, why don't you, perhaps you could tell us about the book that you've just, just uh, written and published and what you're doing with that and your interaction in schools. And then maybe link that to what, what Catherine and Philip said in terms of, you know, the, the whiteness of music education, what you see, what you see in the, on the, at the school level. Sure. All right. Um, I as, as both of you are talking, it's, it's been fascinating. I've been making a few notes and um, I'll, I'll come back to things that you, you both have said. Um, but yeah, just to pick up what you just said, Casper, um, the book that I've, I've just published is called Where Are All the Instruments West Africa? And it's a book for, say, two to five year olds, two to six year olds, um, to really introduce them to instruments from West Africa. Right? Because there's this idea, and I think we see it in, in schools, we see it in education widely, that the only music that's taught to, 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 to young people is pretty much, um, from West Africa anyway, is pretty much djembe drumming, which is, you know, like a, an add-on to everything else that, that, that children study. Right? And so the whole point of this book, a very simple book, um, was not only to um, introduce instruments from West Africa that many of you might have heard of and some of you may not have heard of, such as the Alundun, for example, um, the Kora, um, Bara drums and all different kinds, um, but also in the way of presenting what these instruments are and where they come from, it was really important to make sure that the instruments were, were shown to be part of specific countries, even though obviously for colonial reasons, um, we don't know, we, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly where some of these instruments were from, but you know, it's generally um, assigning different certain instruments to certain countries um, and being very specific about where these countries are and giving background to these countries. So whether it is talking about a specific um, natural um, resource or a natural, you know, uh, for example, uh, the Pink Lake rep rep bar in Senegal, for example. Um, so giving young children, not only like I said, the instruments, but also giving them context into the, into the continent and this specific part of the continent itself. Um, because oftentimes for many young people, the, the, the ideas of West Africa or even Africa in general, forget about West Africa, right? It's Africa as the country Africa. It's often you know, one of poverty, it's one of war, it's one of famine, it's one of disease. Um, it's one which is in many different ways doing much better than the UK, <laughs> especially right now. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, no doubt. So what's really interesting, and um, um, like I said before, before everyone came on with um, uh, Philip Yule's work, um, I, I wrote a poem called If I Were a Racist. And to be honest with you, I don't remember if I saw your article before I wrote this or after, um, but it was pretty much at probably a similar time I published that in around June um, 2020. I remember that poem. Oh, oh wow. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I do. And um, I think this, it was a, it was a, in some ways, a, a frustration of mine, I think, for, for years of thinking about these things, starting from when I was an undergrad. And um, I decided to, even though I didn't get any help, unfortunately, decided to write about music from Barbados, um, which was me, in, in some ways, exploring my heritage and exploring. Were you, sorry to interrupt, Nate, were you a music student? I was a music student, yeah. And when you said you didn't get any help, was that because there was no expertise available to you? In terms yeah, of exactly, exactly. It was just a matter of, you know, me trying to figure out and trying to learn a bit more about my own heritage um, by realizing that we're talking about a very specific, Barbados is a very, very small island. We're talking less than 400,000 people on the island, right? Um, but it has very interesting, and I use that word loosely, um, uh, colonial, uh, really interesting colonial history, even to the point where it was made a republic last year, um, which is you know, in many different ways might start to spark other Caribbean countries becoming republics as well, also who already are. Um, but in that process, it started to, and, and it alluding to some of the things that you were talking about um, earlier, you start to see how some of the, the historical writings about Barbados specifically, and specifically about the music, um, some of the derogatory ways they talk about, you know, the Africans and their barbaric music, et cetera, et cetera. And these were things that, you know, I'm 21, 22 at the time. 
I've never come across, never told. And I think this is one of the really um, interesting things about white racial framing, if I can use your, your, your term, um, is that we're not taught these things, right? These things are, these are, these are things that we I think for many of us, we learn because we try to figure out as opposed to being in class and you know, hearing, this, this, hear, hearing this language kind of banded around. We don't hear it, it doesn't, it doesn't come up. And I think part of what I am I'm really passionate about is, is helping young people, especially, because I think in different ways, adults are, we're, we're already lost, we're already thinking, no. <laughs> right? But it's about younger generation, helping them to understand that, not just like for me, it was, it was important and it is important for you to explore your own history, not necessarily just from a racial but standpoint, but your identity, and you can do that through music, right? It doesn't have to be in spite of music or it doesn't have to be um, outside of music. You can do it through it. And so even though I didn't get that much help in terms of you know, the content and how I started to frame my, my dissertation, which ended up being a look into why there isn't much written about talk music in the first place. Um, and what was interesting in that actually, the person who, the only other person who had written about this type of music extensively was, was, was a white woman from Newcastle. Um, so in effect, it's the only person of Barbadian heritage to have written about this music from Barbados, right? And then in a, in a really weird twist, I went to Barbados and I presented and I talked about this music and I asked to get my, you know, to get the, do you, do you put papers into the museum, the National Museum? And they said, yes, but only if you have a PhD. And to me that, you know, again, there's so many different threads and so many different things we can go off into. But again, this talks to me about how knowledge is valued and what knowledge is valued. Um, you know, you have to have a PhD to be able for your work to be of sufficient quality to be in a bar in a museum from bar, in Barbados, right? Yeah. So, so many different, like I said, so many different threads to pull on. Um, but essentially, I think what we some of the things that we're looking at anyway is just how whiteness has been so undetected, kind of like this, you know. Uh, carbon monoxide, which is it's just there, and we've you know we can't detect it, and we haven't been able to detect it until I think not even fairly recently, but it hasn't been given the the platform I think it needed to until fairly recently, and it took it didn't I don't think it even took think it took it took George Floyd to to, to, to be murdered. I think it took a worldwide pandemic for people to stop, and for and to be frank, white people to not be able to do what they normally do. To be able to actually see, okay, actually there is these these brown folks and black folks are talking about something that we we actually can't we we can't we have to see it we have to pay attention to it because I can't do I can't norm blank it out and do what I normally do right so I think that's yeah anyway and I think exactly. thank you Nate that is wonderful and um, we need to share that poem of yours I've seen it and it is wonderful and I'm sure it's on the internet somewhere I imagine and thank you everyone I've, Catherine and, and Kaim have been sharing the reading I'm so thrilled that people are asking for reading. Uh, it's not the usual way around. Um, so um, I, I just want to bring Kayam in here. Now, of course, um, we can take what Kayam says very seriously because he has got a PhD. Congratulations, Kayam. That was just recently <laughs> a PhD. What you said, yeah, you, you were still worth listening to before that, um, but well done. I know it can be quite a... Um, I want to sort of bring this, you know, well, one of the reasons I was so excited to bring you together with Phil and Catherine in this conversation and Nate was that what... I mean, you and I have been done in events before where we've talked about your work, so I've, I've got a, a little handle on it. And it seems to me the most concrete example uh, of the kind of thing that Phil was talking about across music theory. So can you just, first of all, just give us a little sense of your, a potted sense of your kind of musical background, because it's quite, I think it's quite material. And then, then tell us about what you discovered or why, why you did what you did with music technology. Thanks very much, Casper. I just want to say a quick thanks to everybody. Um, you're all massive inspirations, especially your work, Phil. Um, you put me on a couple of interesting paths while I was doing my study, so I'll share a couple of those anecdotes in a minute. Um, and thank you again, Casper, for the invitation. Um, quick note about me. So uh, my family's from Iraq, from Baghdad. I was born in Damascus in Syria. I started playing the violin age eight. Uh, we moved to London as refugees when I was nine. I got into punk rock, I started playing drums in metal bands, and then aged 
Well, 23, 24, around 2005, I enrolled myself into the um, ethnomusicology program at the School of Oriental and African Studies. I think it's worth saying the full name. <laughs> um, not and did, okay. yeah, I did a BA um, in ethnomusicology, followed by a master's. Um, and then I just took some time out. Uh, so I started playing the Oud. I started studying and researching Arabic music um, around the same time. And then once I'd finished the masters, I, um, I took some time out to just perform and, and travel around the Arab world. Um, and during that period, my, my interest in rock music, my interest in electronic music maintained, even though all of my energy was going into studying Oud, I studied Indian tabla um, at SOAS, I studied gamelan, etc., etc. So there was always this parallel thing going on. And um, one of my interests all the time was music t technology and uh, using, you know, uh, digital tools for making music, for recording music. So as an engineer, as a mix engineer, as a recording engineer, I was always involved in those kinds of projects, but I was always very frustrated. And um, to just ping back to Catherine's uh, mentioning of her studies with Professor Widdes, I also studied Indian classical music with um, Professor Widdes, and I remember him talking about Schenkerian analysis with regards to Indian classical music. So that was my first introduction to Schenker, actually, um, which is kind of strange. But um, my frustrations at the time were like I couldn't use digital tools that I knew that I was using previously and that my friends were using, neither to learn the music that I was interested in, nor the music that I was being taught, so whether it be the music from the African continent or the music from Eastern Europe or the music from um, uh, Azerbaijan or Iran, not, you know, or obviously um, uh, Southeast Asia or South Asia. None of none of the tools were 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 um, malleable enough to allow any kind of interaction with those musical cultures, even from an analytical and a, and a music theory perspective, right? let alone a creative one. And so I put all of those frustrations aside and I concentrated on my acoustic studies. And then finally, you know, a few years ago, I the, the the desire came back again because I realized that one of the major problems we have as young people, not so young now, but younger earlier, and, and this desire to connect with our uh, heritage or with musical cultures that we have any kind of affinity for, whether we belong to them racially, biologically or not, is that many of them have somehow become irrelevant in the way that they are executed today. Irrelevant in the sense that they don't have a direct relationship with the way that people live their lives today. In Across the Arab world, Arab-speaking region, in Iraq, for example, the, the, the musics of those countries that were held in such high regard in the 50s, 60s, 70s, today just cannot compete with everything else that's going on. And so I was really interested in this idea of actually being able to express myself rather than through my acoustic instrument, but through some of the digital instruments. And then what I realized very quickly um, was that I was still up against this wall where Western art music theory is the fundamental groundwork. It's the, the fundamental design principle of almost all sonic technologies that we have at our disposal today, whether that be uh, desktop audio workstations like Ableton Live or Logic or Pro Tools that people might be familiar with, or drum machines, um, synthesizers, uh, everything somehow stems from this fundamental design principle, which is Western art music theory. And by that, we're talking about the equal division of time and the equal division of pitch. And because I'm an oud player, it's a, it's a fretless instrument, because I studied the maqam music of the Arab-speaking region and uh, the wider Middle East, I'm very interested in tuning as well. And I found that tuning as a subject was actually a, an, a wonderful key to interrogate these tools. And through my research, I obviously came across um, Phil's white racial uh, music theory in the white racial frame article uh, when it came when it was published when he when he did his uh, plenary presentation, and for me it absolutely um, uh, uh, typified this problem that that there is a supremacist perspective in music theory in music education that Western art music is the most sophisticated is the most um, advanced music in the world and therefore its fundamental principles need to be the the groundwork upon which everything else is built 
and 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 the the, the problem with the musicologic the music tools the sonic technologies that we have at our disposal today is that the majority of them don't allow for any other explorations except through hacks and workarounds which are incredibly frustrating and there are a few that do have some of those capabilities but even those capabilities are very very limited and very often they're not meaningful and i use this word many times and people tend to get a bit confused what i mean by meaningful design and, and ultimately what i'm talking about is the ability to engage with something in a way that makes sense to the culture or, or to the knowledge that somebody has and wants to ex ex uh, expand upon. The other flip side of this, for me, has always been this um, relation between culture and experimentalism. And, and for me, culture and experimentalism are not mutually exclusive, but that's very often the idea that we are fed through the discourses and discussions, whether it be a, in, within ethnomusicology or within music theory. Um, there's somehow like, you know, if you want to do something within a musical culture that isn't Anglo-European and you want to break some of the rules, then somehow you are defacing or, you know, uh, allowing for impurity to uh, infest this musical tradition, which should be preserved and looked after and we, you know, we should be documented and archived and et cetera, et cetera. Whereas if you're experimenting with noise pedals and, you know, screaming out of your, uh, uh, I don't want to say rude words, um, then, then that's absolutely fine, you know? And this, this schism for me is, was very, very problematic. So rather than being, uh, rather than being um, received as an angry Arab critic of music technology, I decided to actually create a tool or a pair of tools that would allow me as a musician and a composer and a, and a researcher uh, and an experimentalist the opportunity to play with some of these ideas, practically speaking. And what that led to was the design of two browser-based tools called Lima and Apotome. I'll share a link in the chat to them in a moment. One, uh, Lima allows for the creation of tunings and the uh, immediate interaction with them as, alongside accessing tunings that are in a database which is being updated all the time. And Apotome is a generative music environment that is based on those tunings. Um, and so for me, having the capability to have a musical idea or a hunch or a desire and then to just be able to open my web browser next to my email and dive into an idea and hear it and feel it immediately without having to deal with workarounds and hacks and things not working, etc., was really, really liberating. And, and I'll be very honest with everybody, I haven't stopped using it since the day we started building it. Um, it's been it's become a fundamental part of my workflow and a fundamental part of my research. And I just want to touch on one tiny thing uh, which relates to Phil's work. Um, when I was uh, sharing some ideas um, on Twitter, Phil mentioned a phenomenal book to me called Black Athena uh, by Martin Bernal. And this is a phenomenal book in which Bernal basically dissects the fabrication of ancient Greece as the cradle of civilization. Um, and the reason why it was so pertinent to me and to my work is because when, any, when you do any research about the subject of tuning, the first thing you come across is the ancient Greeks and particularly the figure of Pythagoras. And whenever you research anything about M Middle Eastern tunings and the maqam system, etc., the first thing that you get is that oh, this was all developed based on, you know, the works of the Greeks. It was translations of Greek works, which then allowed the Arab theorists and philosophers to develop their own ideas. And so I started researching some of the Greek theories and Pythagoras, etc., in order to try and understand, you know, how these links happen and what these ideas share. And uh, thanks to uh, Phil's recommendation of this book, uh, you know, all of a sudden the supremacy became blatantly clear. You have uh, a huge amount of Oxbridge scholars in, you know, and, and German scholars from Göttingen and elsewhere in the what, 19th century onwards, all literally proposing the idea that, you know, Greece was the cradle of civilization to the ridiculous point where one of them even says that it's impossible for the sciences and philosophy and mathematics and everything else to have developed from anywhere else other than Greece, because nowhere else has a temperate climate, oh. that the only place 
that has a temperate climate in the world that would allow such philosophical uh, development of the human mind is Greece, you know, and this is crazy, especially when you get into things to do with archaeology and, um, for example, the issue, the, the idea that um, the statues and the, the beautiful buildings in ancient Greece, which are today seen as white marble structures, were not originally white marble, they were actually colored, okay. and the, the pigments that were used represented the skin color of those people that were from there and that moved around there. Another really interesting thing that I, I found out was everybody knows Pythagoras as being Pythagoras of Samos, which is an island supposedly in Greece. But if you type in Samos into Google Maps and start to zoom out, you'll see that it's slap bang against Turkey. Um, and then through reading uh, some of Pythagoras's biographies, I realized also that Pythagoras was born in uh, Saida, Saidon in Lebanon. So uh, all of these not even elements Greece. of Greece, not even Greece. <laughs> so all of these, and not only that, but that he was told by his teachers in Greece, in Samos, to go to Egypt to study because he was so bright. And on his way, he went to Lebanon, studied in Byblos, all the temples, went off finally after 10 years to Egypt, studied all over Egypt. And then while he was there, he was taken by an army to Chaldea, which, in, which is in Mesopotamia, continued studying there until finally he returned to Samos age 55. He spent 26 of years of his life, you know, across Lebanon, mod, so modern day Lebanon, modern day Egypt, modern day Iraq, studying in the temples with all of the mathematicians and, and the philosophers and the uh, priests. So this idea that there is some kind of purity to a, a, a musical, construct uh, is just ab it is an absolute fabrication and that supremacy which uh, um, the heart of which lies in those uh, ideas of uh, about race and about um, you know which part of the world geographically was more capable of nurturing that kind of mentality reflects exactly what Nate was saying earlier and exactly what Phil has been saying that um, these are supremacist racial problematics that ha we have inherited. And the fact that we've inherited them without questioning them is why we are at where we are at today. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is why, as Phil mentioned, we can't say the words that music theory is white, but we'd have to say it lacks diversity, right? Because ultimately upsetting that status quo means in a way those who have been perpetuating this whiteness somehow seem to lose their sense of self, their mm -hmm. sense of culture, their sense of where they came from. And um, when I've been talking about these uh, issues and sharing my work and doing workshops, etc., you know, there's also been a reasonable amount of pushback, particularly to an article that was published in Pitchfork magazine called Decolonizing Electronic Music Starts With Its Software. And um, many people were like, oh my God, now, you know, where are we at with all of this woke nonsense? Whoa, Even whoa. Ableton, Ableton is racist. Is that what you're saying to me? And it's obviously not what I was saying. What I was always trying to say is that the, the, the remnants of colonial logics are embedded within the tools that we use to think about, to analyze and to create music, let alone the musical theory itself, right? And so this for me is, is, is the issue. And this is what I've been trying to kind of work against. I am. Thank you so much for that. And you raised so many interesting things. It, it reminds me of um, so much, but the, the, the way ideology naturalizes itself or naturalizes history and becomes unspoken or, you know, Stuart Hall writing about the way that whiteness is the kind of organizing principle of the racial hierarchy without actually being visible at all. It's just nowhere to be seen. Now, you mentioned pushback to your article, Kaim, and I, you also earlier on when we were talking mentioned a uh, pushback to Phil. So let me just Let's just uh, note where we are. So we've been talking for about an hour, a little bit more. I realize actually we should have scheduled this for about four hours because we've got a lot to get through. But I do want to hear, I do want to get involved with uh, with questions and things like that. So, but I do want to hear from, from all the panelists again before we do that. So maybe moving moving quite rapidly, I would just, just to look at what's happened in the intervening years really, Phil. I mean, at the end of your article from two years ago, you made some recommendations. I wonder if those recommendations any of them have come come to to be, but also I think there's been just like Kyan was mentioning with his with with the article about him, uh, some pushback, and maybe you could just tell us how the the forces of the white racial frame have re responded to your your work. 
Yeah, th that's a great question. Um, just with respect to the recommendations, generally, no, I would say, uh, you know, it's difficult to follow through on some of these structural changes that that are required. Um, the the pushback was severe. It was vociferous um, to my work. Uh, there was an entire journal issue devoted to uh, not just not just answering some of the claims I made in a very short talk, but also denigrating me and denigrating, frankly, blackness. It was a very anti-black enterprise. This was the volume twelve of the Journal of Shankarian Studies, which is something I unpack in that in that book that I mentioned earlier that I have coming. If, out. if I might say, it was it was absolutely libelous. Some of it. <laughs> yeah, it was. They published an anonymous response. It was entirely not peer reviewed, and so that's the reaction, of course, one of indignation, just apoplexy. I would say the white racial frame got apoplectic. Uh, when it gets challenged. So, you know, in, in terms of making some changes, uh, I think Catherine had, had noted that that there's an investment in, in the structures and institutions of whiteness are deeply invested in the status quo, right? It's power they that they have and they want to maintain power. I can't even blame them. That's just kind of human nature in the sense that people who have power want to keep it. I, I, I understand why that is among humans. One would hope that if a human is faced with uh, ethical and moral considerations that they could say, oh, in that case, I should probably change and relinquish some of this power. That would be the right thing to do. Um, but that hasn't happened, uh, uh, certainly in, in a large sense in, in American music theory. The one thing that I would, I would highlight in, in discussing pushback is um, what I have called uh, a lot recently in recent lectures, the difference between DEI work, uh, that's diversity, equity, and inclusivity. You have a different initialism that you use there, but but we all know what we're talking about. In Canada, it's EDI, so, same and it is- same, same here, yeah. EDI. Okay, EDI, there you go. And that, of course, especially after George Floyd was lynched in May of 2020, that's become extremely important to musical institutes. It's become important in, in the world, and certainly in the United States writ large, but it's also reflected in our music institutions. So there's a lot of Black Lives Matter activity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I've very much challenged that directly in a talk. I often talk about, I often say that DEI activities are the oxygen that white male structures need in the 21st century to justify their existence and maintain power, and that they do. When you actually come in with cold, hard data and ideas, for directly confronting whiteness and maleness as structural elements, which will entail dismantling some of those elements. That, by the way, is called anti-racism and not DEI. There's a very clear distinction. We should all keep that distinction in mind. That is when white male structures can get very apoplectic. And I note, not insignificantly, that not everybody in those white male structures is, in fact, a white cisgender man. The second in command in a white supremacist patriarchy obviously is white women, right? They're the second most invested in the whiteness of the system here in the United States. Well, I won't mention any names because I feel like I'm going to swear if I do. Some of the uh, politicians, white women who are, you know, not very nice people. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but but they're quite, you know, out there and they're quite prominent. So it's extremely important to kind of bear those things in mind as we're pushing against these systems. It is a struggle. There's no way of getting around that. It's it's not something that's just going to happen organically and it's going to just be all peachy keen and everybody's happy. It's just not going to be that way mm -hmm. because when power structures see that they might lose some power, they can kind of lose their shit. Sorry to uh, to, to swear there, but very well that, that way. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a pretty mild word, you know. I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure over there too. Um, but they do, they'll, they'll lose their shit. And, and that is when, but that's also when you know that you kind of have, you've made a good point, right? And you probably are on the right track of anti-racism in, in confronting these things. Um, you know, the whiteness in the United States has become in a sense, a global understanding of whiteness. I mean, our understanding of whiteness started in the 17th century. The first time it was written in legislation was in the Virginia House of Burgesses. It was a bunch of English men, right? And that was 1691. Mm -hmm. 
And um, uh, Rebecca Ann Gertz has a great book called The Baptism of Early Virginia, How Christianity Created Race. Um, if somebody might want to put that in, uh, The Baptism of Early Virginia, if somebody can put it in the chat, Rebecca Ann Gertz. Um, and uh, that colonial settler, those definitions of race created the concepts of whiteness that very much even extend to a large extent in, in, in England and, and, and continental Europe. But but I hasten to add that white supremacy itself, of course, was a European invention. Let's just have a group nod on that. It was most certainly not a United States invention, uh, white supremacy. And, and, you know, as I sometimes point out to European colleagues on Zoom calls, I'll, I'll tell a little secret here. The people who created white supremacy in the United States they were from Europe. <laughs> mm. Awkward, yes. Yeah. It is a little awkward, right? Yeah. Little, um, little... <laughs> what, one thing that strikes me while I'm listening to you, you know, we, we we did use the word decolonizing in our kind of you know introduction of this of this event, and what you're saying very much sort of accords with you know work that I'm aware of. Let's say in um, in relation to film studies, my colleague Linda Way Dovey or, or Clive Nwonka is doing this in relation to the BFI, the British Film Institute or Anamik Sahar in relation to the creative industries, which is to suggest that, as you say, that diversity initiatives and a little bit of tinkering around the edges and the odd few more black people in some kind of position isn't just not gonna do the job, but it's actually part of the problem. And it's the part of the problem. It, in fact, like I said, it's the oxygen that these structures need to justify their existence. Here in the United States, it's all about Florence Price right now. You yeah. might know that, that name. Yeah. She was a composer. She wrote symphonies and string quartets. And now we're like, oh, that's that solves the problem. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. Yeah, that hurts I, to the I, curriculum. I like her music quite a bit. We need to understand why she was never put out there to begin with. And that is because she couldn't possibly have been up there with Beethoven and the others because it just upsets the racial order of things. Yeah. I mean, and it probably probably also includes telling the story of someone like Anina Simone, whose route into classical music was blocked by yeah. the school that didn't accept her. So there's a kind of, there's a need to go back over that. But yeah, in terms of changing structures, Catherine, um, you, you told us a bit about the letter that went into the to the uh, ethnomusicology and what what what's the current state of play? Do you see any sign of a kind of changing structure of that having an impact, or is it is it still you know a few? Yeah, so I mean I I mean I think I think it, it would be really interesting to 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 follow up on on that because I've you know for the last I mean I think for the last you know two years in fact fact I've I a COVID teaching you know sort of eighty hours a week with you know. Plus yeah. homeschooling. They might my, my, my son's just come home and he's just turned the TV on because the football's on. Um yeah. and um and um and then you know finishing my book. <laughs> so which 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 means that I'm I'm actually, you know, sort of probably not best placed to answer answer this question really. Um but I mean I think I think two years is 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 too short a time um to 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 see any change. I think the the I mean the the, the issue for me is 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 really that um there shouldn't be an eth an ethnomusicology and there shouldn't be a musicology and there shouldn't be a music theory there should be a music studies and with that is a radically egalitarian field um and you know i shouldn't say to phil well i'm sorry phil um you have to study mixed race music you're not allowed to study uh white people's music because you're not white um, and you know, I shouldn't be able to say to to Nate, sorry, Nate, you can't study Indian ragas. You can only study the music of Barbados, <laughs> right? So you know, this this there there needs there needs to be um, it needs to be much more egalitarian. But actually, I mean, I'd actually like to hear more from Nate actually mm. about the issues with music education because none of none of this gets solved until we have more black people and people of color in position which may and, and it's a very long pipeline it's a very long pipeline and by the time you get to secondary school in the uk it's really too late um so um i know nate's probably turning the light turning on. on his light yeah <laughs> nate, but no, I, I really want to hear more from you about thank you for that link yeah. because i think that's exactly right that we need i mean since uh, nate has already said that it's much too late for all of us because <laughs> we're all adults in terms of accessing children Nate what does it look like at that school level and what do you think it would take to try and make the kinds of structural changes 
in music theory and ethnomusicology and music, you know, technology, you know, with the, the kids that you're, you know, seeing or working with? Um, I think first and foremost, I have to say I'm not a um, I'm not in classrooms every day. Um, so I just need to put that out there. So my my view is 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 almost it well, it's not almost, but it is kind of from the outside looking in. Mm -hmm. in a sense, I just make that clear. Um, and even funny enough, I I was I guess conferred the title of professor a couple of years ago um, for a, a temporary um, a temporary post. So I guess potentially the only one in, in the country at the moment. Hey! Yeah, yeah there you go. Um, I, I don't know what to it's say there. about that. It's, it's, it's somehow it's cool and somehow it's not cool, right? Um, <laughs> I think one, one, of the, one of the things that, you know, I think part of what I do is, you know, like many others, be critical of what, what we see, right? And um, sometimes it's looking between the lines at certain things. So there was a, a document that came out, the New National Plan for Music Education, um, that came out earlier this year. And one of the things that really struck me on that was they, for one, you know, after everything that's happened over the last couple of years, there was no mention of anti-racism, right? Um, there was no mention of, of, of really of diversity in, in, in any sense, really. It was quite, a, I guess, what we come to expect from the UK government, um, trying to keep everything at arm's length, right? It's a very kind of bland document, especially when it pertains to, you know, EDI issues, right? Um, but one of the things that really struck me, it said it, it had a, a quote about, about the UK music industry and it mentioned soft power in there. And I'm, it's, no one really picked that up, but I, I, I looked at that and I thought, hang on a second. To me, that this is, they're trying to tell you something here, right? And I think it, it relates back to something that you've written, um, Philip, about, about this idea of neutrality, because I think there's this, this idea that, you know, the music that we're studying is all neutral and so we're happy and it's fine. And yes, we can add from its price in the mix and that's great. And I, I make an argument, there's an article um, I'm writing for a, for, a, for a book that's coming out, I think next year, um, talking about how you, talking specifically about black women, how you, you can't or shouldn't treat black women the same, shouldn't treat, treat Franz Price the same way that you would treat a Wagner or you will treat a Tchaikovsky or you treat a Beethoven, for example. Um, because it, it, you, you shouldn't. If you do, essentially what you're doing, you're adding diversity, but you're not, you're not doing anything else, right? You're diversifying, but you're not actually looking at who these people were and the, the, the hows and whys and the wheres and all of, the, all of the other questions that surround them even just existing in the first place, right? Um, but this, going back to this idea of soft power, it, 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 was, it just struck me that what we're dealing with here is a system which is trying in different ways to create a, a group of people who think about music in a particular way, who can feed into the music industry in a particular way, so that you know, the UK's soft power will reach more people around the world, right? And I think in some ways that's, that is, that's how deep it gets. It's, it's, it's so much more than, yes, let's, let's study music from, from here and from here. It's like, actually, it's a way of getting people to think and be and interact so that you feed into what the UK wants to do in the world, right? So in a sense, this is it's another form of colonialism that's happening that we're not even aware of. Mm. But I, every now and again, you hear phrases and they put it in there and you realize actually, it's, this is not a benign, just we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to make things better for everyone. It's like, no, let's try, in some ways, it's let's try and get everyone on board to our agenda so that we can push it to the rest of the world. To build the creative industries and yeah, drive I, Grand I, Britain. Yeah. I just had a long conversation at a conference with a friend of mine who teach, teaches at Durham in, uh, in the UK. And he told me about that pipeline of music A-levels and all this different psalmization systems that, that are quite standardized throughout, not just the UK, but in, in former colonies. You know, in, in the United States, it's much more fragmented. We we have all kinds of different things going on in our K through 12 before college, right? Um, but yeah, exactly what you were just saying, Nate, that those roots are just so very deep in a place like the United Kingdom in terms of how you, uh, in, in other words, we humans should be thinking about music and then getting it into that 12 tone, equally tempered universe, Steinways and Bösendorfers and all that. And then uh, what what Kaim was was talking about earlier, how it is just this the, the the I think he said the foundation upon which other musical ideas 
are built. And that's just utter nonsense, obviously, if you're just not, I mean, I imagine at a place like SOAS, you you mostly, everyone here on the Zoom, Zoom gallery will, will agree, but we all know that those structures are there. They're very, very deep in the system. And and I think it makes sense. It, it, it's understandable that when that power gets threatened, that's when people get very unnerved. I think Catherine had talked about some of that, the, the being unnerved aspect of it, which I thought was very it, powerful. It's so fascinating to hear, or, you know, the, the term anti-racism being part of the discourse here as a, as a kind of alternative. It's actually an older, I mean, you know, I, I, it, it was much more common to talk about anti-racism in the 1970s and 1980s in the UK um, as a commitment to actually focusing on racism rather than questions of diversity or can't we all get along? And, and, and you all seem to agree that that, you know, we, we need something of that strength, something which is going to be that you know, confrontational, I suppose you might even say to some people who were like, well, what's race got to do with anything? Well, aren't we all past that? And Casper, I'll I'll actually take a little credit as an American for that. That's probably on the heels of our 1960s legislations when back when the United States government could legislate stuff. We can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the Voting Rights Act was 64, Immigration Act 65. That's when we first allowed non-white people to legally immigrate into the United States. That was 1965, just a little FYI for mm-hmm. my UK colleagues. Um, and uh, it was 1978 when diversity was born. That was the Alan Bakke case, uh, Supreme Court case. It was the University of California versus Alan Bakke. He was a white military veteran who wanted to get into medical school at the University of California, Davis. He didn't. There was there were a quota of minority students, uh, ethnic minorities, who were let in. It made it to the Supreme Court. It was a very messy Supreme Court case, but that's precisely when diversity was born. That's when people, the Supreme Court concluded that the U.S. has a state interest in creating diverse institutions, but but little known is what they said you cannot do in 1978. And that is, you cannot directly address racial injustice in any way. So they essentially killed at that point anti-racism. The the US Supreme Court in the the Bakke decision that was 78, they said enough, enough of our 1960s civil rights, enough of our Martin Luther King stuff, he was murdered in 68, right? Enough of that uh, Title IX legislation, that was 1972, enough. In 1978, the white framework of the United States said enough. And that's when they stopped addressing racial injustice directly. That, it's a very clear legal case. And, and I'm, I'm sure that that had repercussions, uh, certainly. Thank you. Enough. Thank you for that clarification. It's great. It's great that you've got these, these yeah. facts at the tip of your tongue, Phil. Um, I can see that you're working on your book. Oh, have been. Um, <laughs> thrilling things happening in the chat. People are buying people's books and whatnot. And I thank you for that. That's all really exciting. I'm going to get to the audience and questions very soon. So if you if you want to ask a question, you can either post it in the chat or you can just say that you want to ask a question in the chat. We'll use the chat function rather than hands because it's easier to to see who's in what order. So please feel free to to just indicate that you'd like to do that. And if you'd be willing to turn on your camera and your mic, we'd love to see you as well. It can be I feel a bit like talking into a void, although we've got a nice group of, of people here. Before, before we do that, um, Kayam, I just wanted to get a sense of what you think has, has been, I mean, this is a perhaps invidious question because I'm asking you to talk about your own, the impact of your own work, but I wonder, has, has these, these programs that you have put out into the world, because you've made them, I think, free to use, is that right? And they're browser-based. Um, have they been decolonizing electronic music? Is there evidence that things have been changing? How much? What's the take up been? Do you feel comp? Do you feel good about that? Hey, I just want to bring up two points with regards to that. One, I think the issues that Philip and Nate were both talking about in terms of music education and and the idea of anti-racist work uh, are not only a, a UK, a US, a EU problem. It, it really is a global problem. Like when mm-hmm. there's we you know we, alongside the white supremacy, you also have white adjacent supremacy, right? Which is really really problematic. And what I've seen across the Arab world, uh, the Arab speaking region, excuse me, what I've seen across, you know, conversations with people about Southeast Asia, etc. The, the, the reproduction of these problems is equally as strong there. And, and this is something that for me is in, incredibly painful and dangerous, because you realize that um, 
these ideas about music education from 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 the smallest things like children's toys and and I, I think of Nate a lot when I when I come across these ideas children's toys are all you know major uh, uh, melodies right uh, simple European uh, Anglo uh, European songs right that's all, all children's toys are based on children that grow up learning how to sing Baba black sheep or whatever uh, 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 What's the other one about the stars, which I can't remember at the moment? Twinkle, twinkle. Uh, twinkle, twinkle, little star, before they learn to sing any or learn anything else, right? And um, this is really problematic because it doesn't, in my view, it doesn't have to be that way. Most of those toys just have tiny little computer chips, and those computer chips can be programmed in any way. This is one point I forgot to make earlier, which is the, the issue with my work that I came across is that the technology itself wasn't the problem. It's the way that the technology is being implemented which is the problem. So that's one thing. With regards to my work, ever since we released these tools in January 2021, I've been doing workshops and um, yeah, online sessions and uh, giving lectures and seminars all over the place. And one big project I got involved in was called Nusa Sonic. Uh, this was initially uh, a series of online workshops, which when led to a compilation album of original works. So I worked with musicians from across Southeast Asia um, Philippines, Myanmar, uh, uh, Indonesia, etc., etc. We had a series of online workshops. Then everybody produced their own electronic music track using the tools and and using that that way of working. Uh, we just did the same, but in a live iteration in Vietnam uh, earlier in October. Um, that's that was absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I can't say much about how they're being used and what kind of impact they're having, but I do know that within the circles that I move and the conversations that I've been having with people, the ideas have had impact and people are becoming more and more cognizant of the fact that they are somehow self-colonizing, right? Mm. Um, and, and back to your initial question about this idea of whether decolonizing is the right word or not, I think... It's, it's obviously been very much a key word recently, and I've been leaning more towards thinking about decolonial uh, work, right? Yeah. Practice itself rather than to decolonize something, because I don't think we're ever going to be able to decolonize things. We just need to have a decolonial approach. But I'm also thinking a lot about um, Edouard Glissant's concept of creolization and how things are, uh, you know, should be allowed to uh, creolize and to be creolizing all the time and this i so so creolization is the idea of allowing different cultures to interact but without having a definite plan and therefore allowing for results that can't be um uh, predicated in advance or predicted in advance so i'm leaning more towards those kinds of approaches and i think a creolized music studies um curriculum a creolized uh, music programming a creolized creative industries would would be far more generative than just trying to root out some of these bad change things. one yeah model for another thank you Kyan. that's that's fascinating um, we've got loads of questions so let, let's um let's open it up so like i said if you want to ask a question um, and I call on you, please feel free to put on your camera and your mic and, and, and ask that. I should just say that Isaac has posted a question, which he says is no point in unmuting for, which is just to say he's looking for uh, books and reading on approaching music from the kind of lens that we've kind of sketched out here, a decolonial lens. So um, uh, academics, unleash yourselves onto the chat. Um, please uh, do that. But in the meantime, uh, let's have a question from Shane. Shane Beals, do you want to turn on? Yeah. Hello. Hi, Shane. Yeah. yeah. Greetings from a Peckham flat. Um, Perfect. I think this is a brilliant panel. So thank you, everyone. Um, so for the panel, does Spotify help or hinder? Um, I, I Can I start? Yes, please. That's OK. So um, I think that it's a really good question. It's probably a bit of both. But if I can, um, you know, sort of add something from, um, you know, mildly empirical, I had um, a, an Indonesian student um, a couple of years ago um, at master's level, and she did her dissertation on uh, Spotify and what was going on with Indonesian popular music. And her argument pretty well backed up was that Indonesian musicians are beginning to sing more and more in English rather than in Indonesian because of the spot because Spotify algorithms 
um, that you, you know, it's just a greater reach if you sing in English, which I think is a terrible shame for, you know, global diversity. Um, and um, yes, that's just one small thing, but I'm sure other people have better informed opinions. I am I, 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 I will give the most uh, nuanced answer, I'm sure, but just briefly, I, I would I would opt for the probably more harmful than hurtful um, simply because the the structures that are creating spot the Spotify's of the world clearly are are functioning from that white racial frame that we've been talking about. Of course, as a musician, I lo long ago I would when streaming services started, I'm like, well, I will never. I'm a, I know what I want to listen to. I will never succumb to this. And now I simply push play and lap everything my computer says. Uh, like I lap it up like a dog. So <laughs> we are now living in that streaming world of where it's just you push and you go, and then you're gonna kind of be pushed in these directions. Anyway, Kaim, I'm sure you, you have something to add. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, Spotify is like Google. If you don't know what to search for, then, you know, that's that's the problem. I think um, it, it, everything is available, whether it be Spotify or YouTube. I mean, just today I was helping some researchers do, uh, uh, radio program researchers do some research about um, Iraqi uh, rural uh, musics, etc., and and everything was on YouTube. There's no need to go into libraries and everything else. But you really need to know what to search for, and knowing what to search for means that you need to have some kind of environment around you that gives you um, one represents these music in an equal uh, way. Uh, and and treats them with the same amount of respect and two gives you a hint of of you know where to go world music was supposed to do this but all it did was reperpetuate the same nonsense that everybody's been fighting against and um whether that be on the concert stage or in the publications of a music press or in the compilation albums they released or in all the record labels that they influenced so unfortunately i think for for audiences it's still quite hard because you really have to make the effort there needs to be an active process of research. There needs to be an active process of conversations with those who are well versed in those musics in order to be able to try and have some access. But the beauty is that you now no longer have to spend, you know, 50 uh, sterling on uh, some rare vinyl and get it shipped to you from wherever you can find it straight away. So that's one plus, I guess. Thank you, Brian. Um, I mean, Nate. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm still in the dark. Um, All right, we can see you. We can see you. Kind of just, just one thing, kind of talking about that, but not really. Um, I, I think a, another large part of all of this is, is it's how white, whiteness and, and the economic um, uh, issues that it's caused and is causing in the world as it relates to music education, as it relates to the industry, as it relates to, to, to scholarship as well. I think that's something which I think often we don't talk about um, because again, I think this talks to the power and it talks to the, you know, about resources and the finite amount of resources that we have on the planet. But I think that is definitely something to, to, to talk about and to explore more and to, and to, and to expose. So um, Spotify, harm, helpful or harmful? Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I'd, I'd, I'd say that there's yeah. a lot of harm being caused um, in places, in, 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 especially, especially in, you know, in, in, in I, I hesitate to use the word, um, you know, the West, the, the phrase the West, but especially in countries that, that didn't profit from colonialism, let's say, um, there's probably a lot more harm happening there than there is in, in, in many other places. Indeed. Um, I should say, um, thank you, Mohammed, for your comment. Uh, he made a comment saying, I'm Indonesian, and I can confirm that's true, what you said, Catherine. So I hope you gave a good mark to that dissertation. It was obviously onto something. Oh, yeah. I yeah, should say, um, from my perspective, I teach a lot about Spotify. I'm quite fascinated by the kind of internal politics of the issues. And, and how it works and how it's perceived. Um, I'm a big Spotify user, but what worries me is that in the empirical sort of investigation that I've done, which is strictly looking for records that I own and seeing if they're on Spotify, I worry that people will think that Spotify is comprehensive when it certainly is not. Um, what is actually really interesting is when you find re old records that aren't on Spotify, there's a story which is about licensing, copyright, ownership. It, it opens up a whole research agenda for you but it's certainly what, well, you know, it's not true that it's all there. Uh, and that's the worrying thing. Thanks, thanks for your question, Shane. Um, great to see you. Thanks. So uh, Jack, you've got a question. Do you want to turn on and ask? Well, there may be more than one Jack, but it's the Jack who said they wanted to ask a question. Hey, hey, Jack. Hi, um, thank you very much for um, hosting this and for everyone who spoke. Um, <clears throat> I think I, my question probably would be more directed at Professor Yule. Um, and I kind of say this from the perspective of 
um, someone who's just come out of an undergraduate in music and did a lot of analysis in that. Um, and it'd be kind of what you think is there validity in uh, analytical models that have almost taken their basis from Schenker or in flex on the Schenker and ideas. Um, the one that immediately came to mind would be like Eugene Nama's implication realization model. Um, so yeah, I just, any thoughts about that? And yeah, thank you. Oh, you're, you're muted, Phil. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Um, he's the one who wrote Beyond Shankerism, I think, right? Eugene Namer. Um, And that's probably where that came from. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, ramifications of, of Shankarian analysis, I think, uh, essentially, um, is the larger question here. And um, you know, on the one hand, Heinrich Schenker, who was a very, very fine pianist and quite a good musician and a good vocal coach, uh, which I very much appreciate, right? Not a soloist pianist, but an, a musician pianist, <laughs> let's say. Um, you know, uh, uh, you can sum up his his linear thinking, his prolongational thinking by simply saying, you know, play through the phrase. I mean, I've, I've taught a million music lessons and I've taken even a million and, and a half. Um, as a cellist and, and coachings and, you know, who, who among us hasn't said, you have to play through the fr phrase, you know, get the big picture. I mean, there are a million ways of saying that in any culture, right? You know, music is a temporal art and you, you shouldn't be thinking about one second to, to the next second or two second chunks, four second chunks, keep going, right? Big picture, phrase, all of those things. So in that sense, there's really nothing that special about Heinrich Schenker, because that's what he was doing in a harmonic sense. He was thinking about uh, connecting harmonies, he set sonorities in, in a larger sense uh, throughout the, the span of, of an entire movement of a composition. Um, so in, in that sense, he wasn't that special, but he did a lot of work with interesting music. And I think that there are people who have built on his ideas that are actually, you know, doing some interesting things. Eugene Namor, I don't know that specifically uh, that what, what you're referring to there. I just know the book uh, Beyond Shankerism, which maybe I read like a lot. It's, it's a pretty old book, I think. But uh, with that said, just the, 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 the uh, I'll, I'll now argue with myself just a little bit. Um, with that said, there are many applications of Heinrich Schenker's uh, methods that are extremely inappropriate in American music theory the idea of applying his methods to certain jazz artists. That became popular 15 to 20 years ago because embedded in that activity was this false notion that you could somehow raise up jazz artists to a mythically higher level of music analysis and music sophistication and frankly, musical humanity. That's what was, was embedded in that activity of applying Shankarian methods to certain pop musics, to the Beatles or other pop artists. And that's just wrong. That's nonsense, it's silly, and it has to be called out for what it is. It's, it's, there's nothing to raise up to. There is no mythically higher standard. That's the flaw in that system. Um, and you have to call it out when you see it and when you hear it. Thank you for the question though, Jack. It was a very good question. Very fascinating point you make. It's funny, um, one of the other events we did for the Festival of Ideas, I interviewed Fumi Okiji. I don't know if you're familiar with her book, Phil. She wrote a book called Jazz as Critique, where she engages Adorno on the question of jazz because Adorno is so dismissive of jazz. And um, you know some of these same areas, I mean, Adorno, again, was someone who never sort of looked at himself in the mirror and considered questions of race and brought them right. to, to bear. Oh, that's nice, Catherine. Is there a cup of tea for me there? Oh, uh, yeah, if you'd like a cup of tea. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I was on a, another train of thought. We have another question from Stuart, I think. Stuart, are you there? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, how are you? Hi, very well. Uh, apologies for the views of my kitchen uh, shelves. Um, nice. Thank you so much for uh, all of this. Uh, so I saw you, Dr. Yule, in uh, Adam Neely's video. That was where I first came across you and your kind of work. Um, uh, it was quite a wonderful video. Um, yeah, the, uh, I can assure you that the kind of issues you brought up with music education is not just a thing in the United States. I think back to my own undergraduate where I had, when I was learning horrifying stuff. Um, and there are people now sort of working, myself included, on diversifying music curriculum. I'm particularly inspired by Bovatura de Souza Santos, his epistemologies of the South, and uh, bringing in kind of non-Western perspectives on music into the classroom. Um, 
which I could talk about for hours, but I won't. Um, my question was, how do you have these uncomfortable conversations with people? Um, and this is for the wider panel in general. Um, if without kind of people trying to shut you down, if they get quite defensive about uh, sort of the white racial frame and the legacy of colonialism, how do you kind of try and have the proper conversation in a constructive way? Because I've run up into this quite a few times. I can answer how I how I handle that. Generally uh, speaking, if if I feel that someone is coming from a bad faith position, I don't. I don't engage. Mm. Uh, that, in fact, has been one of one thing that I think I've done pretty successfully over these last few years is I simply will refuse to engage with people I feel are coming from a bad place. And I'm a black American, so I have a kind of a sixth sense when it comes to these things. Mm. I kind of just know like literally a few days ago that Norman What's-His-Face who writes something like called Slip Dist or something, you probably know about it because I think it's in the UK, you know, wrote something and he mentioned my name. Like, I don't even know his last name and I don't want to because he's mm. apparently trying to engage me, but he's not, right? He's clearly, def he's going to defend the Beethoven side of things. Um, I hear he's not a very nice individual, but I don't know him and I, and I, and I doubt I ever will. So, I mean, that might not be the most helpful thing to say, um, yeah. but it's just honest from my side. If, however, you feel that someone is not coming from a bad place, but they're coming from a conservative place and you feel you could have an honest conversation with them and, and debate some issues, that also has happened uh, with me. The one piece of advice I would give to everybody here is don't allow the white male, the, the, what I call the white male frame to, to don't play on their playing field, on their pitch. It, let's at least the, the, the soccer term here, the, the football term. If you walk onto the pitch of white racial framing and try to argue, for example, that uh, Joseph Ballone was every bit as good a composer as Franz Joseph Haydn, you lost that argument before it started. You can't do it, it cannot be done. You, there's no amount of data that anybody could give to say that Joseph Ballone, who you probably all know, was a Black composer who lived in the 18th century, who wrote music that sounds like Haydn. You won't convince somebody that it was as good as Haydn, even though that person could probably not distinguish the two if you played them two excerpts from the middle of a symphony, right? You have lost the argument before it started if you walk onto their pitch. So my advice is don't. But if you feel the person's coming from a good place, say, hey, walk on over to my pitch and let's play by my rules for a little bit. And my rules, we're not going to talk about, uh, you know, bar 57 of a, of, a, of a third symphony. No, no. We're going to talk about the impact of, uh, of, of a racialized system whereby we actually have been taught that there's something about this quote unquote Western system. We've already talked about how this is just a mythology of the late 19th century, by the way. The West was invented only in the late 19th century, let us not forget. And let's talk about some of these legacies of these injustices. And then let's actually have that conversation, the conversations that we're having here, for example. And if that person is um, open and, and, and not coming from that bad faith place that like that Norman Watts' face is, you can actually then have a conversation about bigger issues and leave Joseph Ballone and Franz Joseph Haydn alone. They, they died over 200 years ago, right? So uh, I, that's about as, as good as I can get, but that's a really good question, Stuart, thank you. A fabulous question. And um, I'm, I'm gonna just jump in here because I'm aware of time and in particular for Nate, and I should, because Nate's gonna have to bounce in a minute because he's got a gig down the road, which I'm going to after this event and I can't wait. Um, and Nate can tell us what the band is, but there's someone here who's got a question for him, which I thought we, we don't want him to go without having a last thing to say. So I think the name is C, C. Little. Are you there? C, hey, hello. Hi, Casper. Um, yeah, so I had a question kind of as a secondary school music teacher, this is something I, you know, run into a lot and figuring out how to move the, the key stage three curriculum specifically. Specific because if we have students coming into year seven who can't read any music and then we are expect then they are expected to access GCSE and potentially a level music curriculum how do we still create how do we create a more equitable anti-racist curriculum with regards to everything that phyllis said in his article but also that fits into the expectations that the school has the national curriculum has and then exam boards 
parent. And I'll just say this is something I care about very much because my son is in year eight, so he's doing key stage three right right now, and I'm astonished that he has to play the keyboards when he's he's never played the keyboard. He's a sax player, but and he can read music, but they make him play the keyboard, mm. which is hard. Sorry, but that was no, no, the question was for Nate, and I interrupted. No, no, it's fine, Nate. No, you... absolutely. Um, I, I'll, I'll try to be really quick. Um, for one, I, I think I think it's going to take a long, 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 long time to be honest with you, um, if at all. So I think part of the focus of my work is creating resources that can be accessed outside of outside of that. Um, so whether it's like my, my podcast or it's, it's the books that I do or even some of the articles or whatever it is, it's for me. It's it's looking at like right now. Yes, we're gonna. We're going to put pressure on, on, on some of the examples. We're going to work on trying to change things. But while we're trying to change things, I personally, I just I feel like I need to make sure that there are resources out there for young people who want to learn about different things, but they haven't, they're not going to get it in school right now. Um, you know, they want to explore different styles of music or they want to, you know, figure out how to how can I incorporate rap into my into the onto the saxophone, which is something I'm into, right? Um, so creating these things that sit outside of school. So that they can access these things, and if they go and do GCSE, then great, and whatever you get, great, good on you. If you don't go and do that, there's still stuff that you can access and still stuff you can learn from. Um, and and in, so to in, in so creating these resources, also trying to create these resources which are totally embedded within ideas of anti-racism and totally embedded within ideas of you know, decolonization and EDI, all these different things, um, rather than just you know being like, oh, here's something on Florence Price, going to read that. It's like, well, no, let's let's dig into who she was and let's even if there's something on Mozart all right fine but let's 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 look at Mozart for who he was um as a, a privileged a privileged boy growing up in a in a, in a you know born in 1756 if I remember correctly um in a country that's you know not really it's not in the throes of war he's 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 in, he's in you know he's, he's got a piano in his house where you think about or equivalent at that point in time you think about the privilege of that even of itself and his father who was a great um musician himself who has written books and so on so you've got this perfect storm of someone who's in an environment which is in some ways perfect <laughs> to create someone who from the, a very young age is going to be amazing right um, and then juxtaposing that, and there's a whole thing I did before on the link between Mozart and the Haitian Revolution, right? Knowing that these things are happening at very similar times in history, and, and um, mm -hmm. you know Joseph Bul Joseph Boulogne, and then you have like Toussaint um, Toussaint um, the, the two mm -hmm. from Haiti, and just how Mozart. We often take these, especially these these white men, right? We take them, we put them in a bubble, and we say, "Oh, they're great, and they made this music," but. You know, I think part of it's zooming out and illuminating these figures and saying, well, actually, they were part, they were human beings in this part of the world at this particular point in time. And I think this is even something, and I'm, I'm going to stop now, but this is even something I think Christianity has to wrestle with as well, where Christianity kind of pulls this thing of this is, this is how the world is, whereas, you know, the Bible is taken from a very specific point in history, a very specific point in, in time, right? Um, anyway, but it goes on and on, but there's, there's, I think Thank if you really want to read more into stuff like this, I think I've been looking at a lot of, well, a few theologians um, who talk about whiteness and talk about how, you know, you can't divorce whiteness from Christianity. And when you start to look at the, you know, Christianity as a colonizing force in and of itself, and you look at music, and you look at all these different things that you start to see links between all of these things. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. I've Thank got... you, Nate. Um, and then thanks for the question. It was a great question. And um, I love that idea that contextualizing this stuff, you know, historically putting them on the same timeline, thinking what's happening at the same time as what, um, you know, going back to what Kyan was saying about, you know, tracing the journey of some of these people, which actually contradict the way they've been sold. Um, so we're almost out of time, but Robert is, is joined. Matthew, I'm aware that you're, you've got a question to ask and you'll be the last question, but Robert just wanted to make a comment or maybe have a question to join in about, about education and kids. Robert. Please. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much. This has really been a, a wonderful, wonderful panel. Um, I'm chiming in from Germany. Um, I've been teaching uh, music here for now about six years um, from yeah, ages 10 to 18 approximately. And one of the problems I see is number one, of course, also with my with with older colleagues not being willing to really relinquish power in a sense, 
I'm not in power and in in being in the curriculum, of course, and not willing to say, okay, I'm going, we're, we're going to change the curriculum, which means leaving something out that's been that way for 20, 30 years. It's really excruciatingly difficult for them. Um, but at the same time, the this uh, racism and also this this whiteness is perpetuated by simply a lack of of, of material, a lack of resources. Um, because I mean, honestly, as a teacher, I don't have a huge amount of time to do a lot of research, to prepare the material, to have to to really break it down for 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 children, for teenagers. That makes it really really difficult for me. Um, and then when I also think back to my to to, to my own university education in Berlin, um, I had one semester on Turkish music and two semesters on jazz theory. That's it. That's it. So my even my uh, um, background is really limited. And now trying to rework that, trying to prepare that on my own is, is really difficult. It's really hard to do when you're not when you don't have the university resources anymore and so this needs this is something that really needs to change from the ground up and I, I agree with what um what Nate Holder said this is going to this is going to take years this is going to take decades of real work um from the ground up and for me I'm I'm lucky enough to be at, to at the moment be uh, um the uh, um in charge of the of the of, of the the um of music at my school so I can start reworking the curriculum slowly but surely especially since in three or four years my older colleagues will both uh um go uh retire, retire exactly thank you <laughs> we'll both retire so I have the I have the 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 chance the ability to do this but honestly that's what it will take it'll take a lot of of, of uh, a generational change and years and years of work material being I mean if I have a look at the material that I have at my disposal it is it is shocking the way not with the way music is described and the way it, it is it it's terrible frankly um, I have Can I jump? yes please can I jump in there? Uh, Robert, yeah. thank you. It's a really, really great comment. And it's, a, it's um, I've heard this from a number of music teachers who are at primary school, even secondary school level. The, so this, what you've highlighted here are two major issues. One is that um, uh, musicians that end up becoming teachers themselves don't have the, the diversity of musical knowledge in mind because they uh, were, were never given the opportunity to study it. Number two, that absolute lack of materials that exists. You're right that it's a project of generations because ultimately if you want to bring up a, an entire new generation of music teachers that have this knowledge or at least some access to it so they, they know where to start for them to be able to develop things, that's one thing. But I don't, I, I wouldn't think that it's a, that big of a project when it comes to creating materials that allow educators a, a semblance of confidence so that they can pass some of that information on. The issue with that I've seen, particularly in the UK, is that other musical cultures end up being presented from within the the white frame of yeah. the UK or you know, European uh, mindset. So you'll get something like, hey, let's talk about Indian classical music. So today's class is called curry and tabla. And so we're going to talk about, you know, what this kind of stuff is incredibly problematic because Absolutely. it just continues to re-perpetuate these issues. So I think what needs to be done is uh, an approach to um, creating these kinds of resources that does not demean, that, that maintains this, uh, this, this equality of, of representation, you know, because Absolutely. it's just Absolutely. too difficult yeah. for people to get it out of their mind. So, so that's a, a big one. And yeah. Thank you. And just to say that, um, uh, Robert, um, Georgie Pope, who's my good friend and colleague at SOAS, has posted she, she's got a music charity and she's working on some resources. There's a link there. There's various people. We can call it plugging if you want, but putting relevant books in front of you, whether they were written by people on the panel or not. So grab those. And, you know, this, is, this has got to be a collaborative and a collective 
uh, uh, resource gathering, hasn't it? So I'm absolutely, I'm, let, absolutely. Start. And I, that, it's, it's, it's completely inspiring. And when I um, came across uh, Professor Ewell's uh, work two years ago, it, it I, honestly, it blew my mind and it opened my eyes to something that, that I had suspected, but I had never seen. I had never, it's just, it, and it really, it absolutely. That's uh, the thing, uh, Robert, isn't it? I mean, yeah. nobody talks to us about white, you, whiteness, does it, do they? It's not something that people tell us. You're, you're white, you're going to benefit from the way the world is organized. You know, there's this other stuff out there which is being done. It's become, you know, it can be shocking, really. If and, I could just, if I could just say, we, we talked about pushback. There was pushback, not just to the talk, but to the article which came out afterward, the one that we're discussing here. I unpacked that in the monograph. They tried to suppress the publication of that long article. It was a big battle behind the scenes. It was the white racial frame of music theory doing everything it could to suppress publication wow. of that. And I explained that over the course of, I don't know, five or six pages. So it, it, that part, that's also part of the narrative, right? Yeah. Now I have it's a book. Coming out. They, they um, can't, I, I bet all of those people are really into free speech too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. But I mean, you know, this is not separate. What we're talking about is not separate from the wider world, the world of politics. And look how hard, you know, as it were, the white racial frame in, in America in general or in the Western world in general is going to fight. They're going to fight to the end because they feel this is their life or death. You know, we are giving up. Yeah, we're yeah. being replaced, etc. cetera. Um, time for one more <laughs> question, Matthew. Um, before we go, let me just say this. Um, I've, it, this has been so fascinating. It's been a kind of culmination of, 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 a, you know, of something I really wanted to happen, but I hope this isn't the end of it. And I would summarize it like this. When I was a PhD student working on, you know, I work on kind of dance music and, and Afro-diasporic music. And I just remember picking up a book in the library, which called itself the Grove Dictionary of Music. And there was no entry for James Brown. And I thought, <laughs> well, what, what, how can that be? Isn't James Brown music? So what we do is we're going to destroy music theory. We're going to destroy ethnomusicology. We're going to bring it together under music studies. And we're going to get a dictionary, which, a proper dictionary, which has got music, a dictionary of music with James Brown in it and all the other music. And it's going to be a very large book. I would <laughs> like to, will you join me, please, in whatever way you like to thank my amazing panel, Nate, who's just getting ready for a gig. He's running straight onto stage. And I'll see him in a minute. Uh, Catherine Schofield, Kai Malami, and, and, and Phil. Uh, I couldn't thank you more for writing uh, what you did and the work you're doing. I can't wait to read your book and um, consider yourself part of the family and uh, let's let's work together more in the future. So just thanks so much. It's been really thanks for having fun. us. Thank you for this, Casper. Thanks, I everybody. Will, just to let everyone know, this has been recorded. I'll make the recording available to you all so that you can use it in whatever way you like and spread the word. Thanks a lot. Bye. Cheers. See you all. Bye now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you.